Good afternoon. Welcome to European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford School of Engineering. My name is Burton Lee. Today is session seven, February 29, 2016. And we're very pleased to feature a very unique session and speaker today on the subject of Cambridge UK versus Silicon Valley. Today our speaker is Herman Hauser, who is partner and director of Amadeus Capital from Cambridge and London to talk about Silicon Valley versus Cambridge UK. Uh, Cambridge is Europe's largest, most successful tech cluster. And particularly when it comes to university-based tech clusters, Cambridge UK is far, far ahead of other clusters in Europe and a great example of how a country and region can build economy based on the university as a core of its growth model. Today's speaker is Herman Hauser. Uh, met Herman uh, back in September in Elbach, Austria. He is the second partner from Amadeus Capital Partners we've brought here to Stanford, the first being Ann Glover, who spoke here two years ago. Uh, we're really honored that Herman and Pamela could come uh, all the way on their way back from New Zealand, stop off here for 24 hours to speak at Stanford. Thank you both very much. It's a great honor to have you here. So please welcome Herman. Thank you very much for this uh, <clears throat> kind introduction. <clears throat> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, at Stanford. And uh, <clears throat> Burton has asked me to do some, uh, some very un-English things, which is to boast about Cambridge and, uh, uh, and England. We've developed over centuries, we've developed this culture of understatement. So since I'm actually not English, I'm Austrian, I think I'm probably a bit better at the boasting than uh, most <laughs> English people. So. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's the, the background. Uh, this is the postcard picture of Cambridge. When you, when you get a postcard from Cambridge, there's a, probably a 50% chance that it's this college, King's College, which is actually my college. And uh, this chapel here was built by um, people in the um, uh, 15th century. King's College was founded in 1441. It was built for 100 uh, scholars at the time. It took 100 years to build. It was finished in, uh, by, uh, during Henry VIII's reign, who had a tiff with the Bishop of Ely, whose diocese this is, gave King's College to the Bishop of Lincoln. And that's why we had to get a dispensation from the Archbishop of Canterbury to get married in there uh, with uh, Pamela. Uh, so this is just a bit of uh, funny background. Uh, what I'll, I'll talk uh, to you about today is a little bit about the university, then Silicon Fen, which is this funny um, featureless uh, landscape that we have around Cambridge. Uh, when we had some American visitors recently, they concluded that Fen must stand for full enterprise network. It is actually not. It's the name given for uh, our uh, very flat uh, marshes outside Cambridge, then a few people and uh, technologies. So uh, Cambridge is uh, the fourth oldest university in the world. So we're a little bit older than uh, Stanford. We're 800 years old. Uh, we don't mind being fourth after Bologna, which is the oldest university, and Paris, which is the second oldest university. But most unfortunately, Coxford is the third oldest university. <laughs> so uh, we are actually 40 years younger than them. And what is more irritating, we're actually founded by some monks who uh, got into a bit of uh, trouble in Oxford and uh, had to escape uh, uh, to, to Cambridge. However, uh, we have done quite well. Uh, we have uh, very famous people like Newton uh, who contributed to uh, understanding gravitation. And that uh, tradition of being excellent in physics has continued to the present day. So with uh, Rutherford and Maxwell and J.J. Uh, Thompson who discovered the electron and as Steve Hawking pointed out to Gordon more recently, if we, didn't dis we hadn't discovered the electron, he wouldn't have uh, a chip to work on. Uh, and then with Rutherford, uh, he did discover the proton in Manchester, but he did come back. And Chadwick also discovered the neutron. So three out of three for the Cavendish of the rather more important elementary particles isn't uh, bad going. Uh, I also put Conway up there. I don't know how many of you uh, know Conway, but he's arguably one of the most brilliant mathematicians alive. Uh, I met him in um, Cambridge with a 
an eighth order cartwheel under his arm, which is a, a, a very interesting uh, mathematical uh, construction uh, of a fivefold symmetry uh, covering off the plane. And if anybody wants to know more about this, uh, I can elaborate why it's an tenth order cartwheel. Uh, we also have done quite well in computing. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about who produced the first computer, but it's normally uh, a discussion about the first electronic computer. There is no doubt about who did the first computer full stop, and that was Babbage uh, quite a few hundred years ago. Uh, the foundations of computing, and in particular computability, uh, was first um, researched by Alan Turing, uh, with his uh, famous uh, papers. And Maurice Wilkes, uh, in our opinion, no, it's in our opinion, this is a historic fact, produced the first usable computer. There were some computers in America that they claim uh, existed <coughs> earlier. Uh, there was also Zuse in uh, Germany, who arguably produced the first electronic computer. But Morris's uh, computer was the first one that was not built in computer science departments to prove a particular point about that computers could work at all, but it was a computer that was actually built for users. And uh, that's also where the word job queue came from, because people actually queued up literally with their paper tapes to put them into uh, Morris's machine. One slide, uh, just to mention that a replica of part of Babbage's engine is in the Computer History Museum. Yes, uh, uh, Nathan Merbold uh, produced two of them, and one of them uh, is there. And it's also interesting uh, to to tell the story about that uh, about Babbage's machine, because although it was brilliantly conceived, the degree of uh, machining accuracy that you needed in order to actually instantiate uh, the, the computer at the time didn't exist. So although the machine was correctly architected, uh, it, it was never built until Nathan put up the money uh, to actually build it, and it turned out that it worked very well. Now, we've also done quite well in life sciences. Uh, Charles Darwin, of course, uh, a rather important person in evolutionary theory. Then we did the structure of uh, DNA with uh, uh, Watson and Crick, and that was done in the physics laboratory, not in biology. It was actually a breakthrough in crystallography to interpret uh, the, uh, the helical structure. And then uh, another member of my uh, college, Fred Singer, uh, one of only two scientists who got two Nobel Prizes, uh, one of them for a new gene sequencing technique that was the um, basic uh, gene sequencing architecture that everybody used in the world until we revolutionized that again with the company Selexa that I will tell you about later on. But it's not only uh, in mathematics, science, and um, life sciences that, we ha that Cambridge has excelled. Cambridge is very much a, a full service uh, university with all um, subjects, both in the sciences and the arts and the um, uh, and also literature, and here we've got Christopher Marlowe, uh, very famous for his Dr. Faustus. E.M. Foster, again, a Kingsman, uh, Room with a View is probably his uh, most famous uh, <clears throat> novel. And then some of you might know um, Hugh Laurie that uh, Pamela lectured to. Uh, he uh, <clears throat> he uh, played a uh, slightly quirky doctor in a, a US series called House, I don't know how many of you have, uh, have seen that uh, series. But we also have lots of other famous actors that come from the Footlights Review. There's a student uh, review every year called the Footlights. So uh, Stephen Fry, uh, Hugh Laurie, uh, and lots of other famous actors, Emma Thompson, all were uh, in the Footlights. So let me go on and talk a little bit about uh, Silicon Fen. Uh, <clears throat> As uh, Burton already said, there is a new book coming out, uh, The Cambridge Phenomenon, Global Impact. Um, why it was called The Cambridge Phenomenon, I don't know, but the, the name stuck. It's now 50 years old. Uh, the Cambridge Phenomenon is assumed to have started uh, with the founding of CCL, that's Cambridge Consultants, uh, 50 years ago. We now have 1,500 companies, uh, 15 of these companies are now worth a billion dollars. A uh, you know, billion dollars is nothing here in the Valley, but uh, it's, um, it, it was quite an achievement for us to get up to uh, 15 of these billion dollar companies. Uh, only five of them had anything to do with me. 
Uh, there are also 53,000 uh, people uh, that uh, are employed in Silicon Valley. And let's start with computers. Uh, there was a guy called Clive Sinclair uh, who was one of the first people in the world, and in fact, it was my uh, my partner in Acorn Computers, Chris Curry, who produced that calculator, the, uh, the executive ca calculator, which was one of the first calculators in the world to use the Texas Instrument chips. And I think he actually produced the first calculator using that TI chip. And then uh, he became quite famous for the ZX80. It was one of the first home computers uh, that was sold for just um, uh, 70 pounds, and it was a phenomenal success uh, all over the world, actually, not just uh, in the UK. But of course, uh, by far the most important um, uh, company was Acorn, uh, which I founded with uh, Chris Curry, because it uh, produced the BBC Micro, more about that uh, in a moment, uh, and then produced the Acorn Risk Machine, which is now called Advanced Risk Machines, and is uh, the uh, most important microprocessor in the world. Some people here think it is Intel, but I will prove to you that this is not the case. Um, and CSR is uh, one of the leading Bluetooth companies uh, in the world. Uh, this is the Acorn Group. Uh, let me just point out a few of the players. Um, starting at, this is me. This is Andy Hopper, who heads up the uh, computer lab uh, in Cambridge, now his professor. Uh, this is uh, Chris Curry, who did the first uh, calculator for Clive. Uh, Sinclair, he then fell out with Clive and started Acorn with me. Uh, these are, where's Steve? Uh, Steve Ferber and, and Sophie Wilson are the two geniuses behind this BBC Micro uh, and then behind the ARM uh, microprocessor. I'll tell you the story in a moment. Uh, this is Chris Turner, who was my research assistant in the Cavendish lab. I'm actually a physicist. I did my PhD there. This was my research assistant. And he was also the first uh, employee at uh, Acorn Computers. And these people here uh, are from the BBC because there was a BBC program that was uh, based on the BBC Micro. And this is Chris Searle, who was actually the main actor. And this was a, uh, also a BBC person who did um, a lot of the due diligence on that. Quickly, the story of the BBC Micro. Uh, the BBC is quite an extraordinary institution in the UK. And the BBC decided uh, in the 80s that it was time to educate the nation about uh, uh, programming and computers. And they decided that the only way they could do this is to actually produce a piece of hardware so that people could try for themselves. They could program the computers themselves. And they worked with a company called New Brain for two years, and they didn't have a computer. Then they decided this will not do, so they opened it up uh, <clears throat> for six companies to bid for it. They went to see Clive Sinclair, which is one of the six companies. He told them, look no further. I've got the ideal computer for you. You would be mad to use anybody else for this uh, BBC computer. You must use uh, my computer. Now, if you understand the BBC, this is not quite the right approach uh, uh, for the BBC because uh, they had a very clear idea of what they wanted, uh, which was everything in the kitchen sink. It was a very, very advanced computer. And as the story goes, and in fact, there is a, a little film about that, a docudrama called um, Micromen. Uh, they came to see us as one of the six companies on a Monday uh, and told us the specification, which was totally mad. Uh, I went to see Stephen and said, uh, they're coming back on Friday. Uh, is there any chance we could have a prototype? Uh, and he said, <laughs> Uh, absolutely not. Uh, <clears throat> it's completely out of the question. So I rang Sophie and said, uh, Sophie, I've just talked to Stephen. And he said, if we really try very hard, we might have a prototype by Friday. And so he said, this is mad. You know, uh, we, we can't do this by Friday. But if Stephen is in, I'm in. So this, um, this then resulted in uh, <clears throat> three days and two nights uh, nonstop of working. And um, uh, they were coming back on Friday at 10 o'clock. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I'd been making the tea uh, all the time through the night, and uh, the computer wasn't working. So I turned from a tea lady to the hotshot designer that really I am, uh, explained to them that the reason why it doesn't work is that uh, we had uh, connected a clock wire between the development engine and our computer. What we need to do is cut that wire, uh, make it blow the bra, make it a, a standalone computer, and it will all work. 
and it did. They never forgave me for that. Uh, the BBC came, they saw the, the prototype, and we got the contract. Uh, it was uh, an amazing time, because imagine a whole nation being transfixed by a computer program. So at 6 o'clock, people would go home from the pub to watch the computer program. It was called the computer program, the computer literacy thing. And it used this computer. So this became the standard computer in British schools. At that time, we had more com computers in schools than any other nation. And the thing that I'm probably proudest of is uh, that we educated a complete generation of programmers in the UK. So all the, the basis of the UK uh, games industry, of the UK programming industry, is, uh, uh, is partially due to the BBC Micro. And if you want to see more about that uh, funny story of cutting the umbilical cord, etc., uh, go to YouTube and Microman is actually quite a, an entertaining and very well uh, um, <clears throat> acted uh, docudrama. Uh, and apparently the guy who plays me don't, don't just, doesn't, doesn't just look like me, actually he looks, he looks rather better than me because he's younger than I am now. Uh, but he, he, some people say he's more me, more me than me, so he's, he's a very good actor. And it then gave rise to the ARM processor. It's also, I put that in because uh, you're all some of the business people here. It's the only company that I know uh, that had a capital gain of a million fold because we never put more than uh, 200 uh, pounds into the company, and we grew that company uh, into a tw when we went public uh, at 200 million. Every pound that we put in there was worth a million pounds. Uh, so it was unusual because we could bootstrap the company up through um, uh, mail order, as uh, was the case at the time. Now, on to ARM. Uh, this is Steve Thurbo, who is now professor of computer science at Manchester, Sophie Wilson, uh, who uh, then went on to do another uh, microprocessor design called uh, uh, Firepath. Who, who has heard of Firepath? Who thinks they're using it uh, every day? Right. Well, you are. <laughs> it's, uh, it's got a 60% market share of uh, all the processing, uh, all the ADSL processing, all the broadband uh, access uh, in the world uh, at the, um, uh, off as the digital office. Uh, but uh, the real story I want to tell you is uh, the ARM. So these are the three people that are probably responsible uh, for the ARM. And it's um, RISC versus CISC. Uh, some people might have heard of John Hennessy, who um, invented uh, reduced instruction set computers with uh, Patterson. Uh, but uh, normally in Britain, we complain bitterly that we Brits think of it and the Americans exploit it. Well, this is a counterexample. John produced these wonderful uh, papers on reduced instruction set computers, also later had a company called MIPS. But we were actually the first people who produced a commercially available uh, RISC microprocessor, and uh, we then made it a, a, a great success. Uh, but first, why does the ARM exist at all? We went out, uh, we had an 8-bit microprocessor for the BBC Micro, just like Apple, only ours uh, ran twice as fast, and we had twice the resolution on the screen, and we had uh, color and uh, black and white, unlike the Apple II, and of course, uh, we had a, a network connection. So when Bill Gates came to see me and wanted to talk me into using MS-DOS, which really wasn't a a very clever operating system at the time, I sat him down and said, look, Bill, we couldn't possibly take such a retrograde step. Look at our opinion. <laughs> and by the way, you can type a star, I am Johnny, and you're logged on to the local area network, and you can use the same commands to get the files from the file server down the local area network uh, into the computer. And Bill's response was, uh, what's a network? Uh, so we've been ahead in, in networking. It's always been uh, one of our strengths uh, in Cambridge. Uh, <clears throat> and we've produced a number of companies in that area. So we looked for a new uh, processor. This, the 6502 was an 8-bit processor. Of course, we wanted at least 16-bit, uh, uh, preferably a 32-bit processor. We looked at all of them. We rather liked the national 16032 at the time. And then we said, well, the 8286 uh, probably would be good enough. So we went to Intel and said, um, uh, we quite like your chip. 
it just totally screwed, out the, screwed up the pinout because you put both the data bus and the address bus on the pin. Nobody can make a sensible computer out of that. But if you sell us to die, we'll do our own uh, <clears throat> pinout so maybe we can make something of your chip. And they said, get lost. So we were quite cocky at the time. You know, we had a 60% market share of all the PCs, and, and they weren't called PCs. They were all called home computers at the time. So we said, you get lost. We'll do our own. So if, if they had given us the DAI, ARM wouldn't exist. Uh, we then, uh, I then gave two key advantages to that design team, which neither Intel nor AMD nor any of the other microprocessor teams in the world have ever, ever managed to give to their design teams. And the first advantage was I gave them no people because we didn't have any. Um, so it's the only microprocessor in the world that was produced by just two people rather than uh, 50. The second advantage was I gave them no money because we didn't have any. So the only way they could do this is by keeping the design really, really, really simple. And interestingly, a side effect of that uh, was uh, that it was very low power. In fact, it was so low power that one of the first things we did, uh, yeah, I, I have always been very optimistic in my life. So when the chips came back, it was a completely new microprocessor, right? The chips came back. I'd bought two bottles of champagne to celebrate this. Uh, we put it into, into the prototype board. Uh, we switched it on, and of course, it didn't work. So a great disappointment, but it just took one hour to debug it, and it came up, hello world, I'm an arm, which meant that the uh, board work, the software work that we had never run before on a microprocessor. It was really quite, a, quite an emotional uh, event. And then one of the first things we did is we found out how much power uh, this chip consumed. So in those days, what you did is you bent up the power leg and you connected a, uh, you soldered a, a wire on and you measured the, uh, the current. And as Steve bends up the, uh, the pin, he realizes that pin isn't connected. So this chip ran on no power at all, which was rather pleasing. But <clears throat> we couldn't figure this out for a while until somebody was clever enough to realize that the leakage currents from the other pins was enough to power up the whole processor without being connected to the power chip. So we knew we were onto a good thing on the power consumption side. Um, this turned out to be quite important for the uh, mobile phone industry. So Nokia came to see us and wanted the ARM chip. Uh, and that was then the second piece uh, of luck. The first piece was the tremendously low power, but not low performance. We had 20 times the performance of the Z80 uh, at the time, which was the leading 8-bit processor, the ARM being a 32-bit processor, with exactly the same number of transistors. So it really was just a most spectacular increase in performance just for architectural reasons, mainly that risk versus CISC uh, argument. So Nokia then adopted the ARM as the standard for their mobile phone, and then it became the standard in the mobile phone industry. We've got more than a 95% market share. But Nokia also pushed us into the licensing business. Rather than selling them chips, we sold a license to Texas Instruments, who then sold them the chips. So uh, Arm has now become the world's most successful licensing company, worth about 25 billion. Everybody in the semiconductor industry, there's not a single major semiconductor uh, company in the world that doesn't have an ARM license, including Intel. Uh, <clears throat> we sold uh, 12 billion uh, devices last year, uh, which is more microprocessors in that one year than Intel has sold in its entire history. We're outselling them uh, 20 to 1 at the moment. But you're saying, yeah, but they're small microprocessors. You know, it doesn't really matter so much. Well. The value of these ARM processors that were sold since 2010, every year, the value of the ARM processors that we, of course, licensed to about 400 licensees uh, is more than the Intel revenue. So even in dollar terms, uh, ARM is a more important architecture than Intel. Uh, <clears throat> CSR is another very successful uh, semiconductor company in the uh, UK. It's uh, a Bluetooth company, which recently was uh, sold to Qualcomm for 2.4 billion, and it's become the standard in, in headsets. It's also uh, one of our investments at um, uh, Amadeus Capital Partners that uh, is one of our great success stories. Now a few uh, words on life sciences. Uh, <clears throat> I've already uh, told you about the tremendous tradition that we have, especially in uh, DNA analysis. 
Uh, but here is a story about antibodies. This is uh, CAT on the left, Cambridge Antibody Technology, APCAM at the top, and Selexa. So uh, antibodies are very strongly associated with the master of uh, Trinity College, Sir Greg Winter, who did a lot of work on antibodies and is responsible for Humira, which is the world's number one selling drug. In fact, six out of the 10 best selling drugs in the world are now uh, antibodies. He's one of the founders of Cambridge Antibody Technology and more recently a founder of Bicycle. Uh, it's called Bicycle because antibodies, as you probably know, look like these Y molecules that have all the variation at the end of the, of the Y, but they're quite large molecules. So what he's done, uh, and that's why it's called bicycle, is reduced it to just the, the, the bit that are variable that do the actual business. Um, uh, this is uh, a friend of mine called Jonathan Milner, who uh, does a lot of, um, uh, founded AppCam, which is a billion dollar company selling our antibodies. <coughs> Uh, but he's also become a very active angel investor and mentor. So I'm doing quite a few companies with him. Uh, but now to, the, to another spectacular success story, uh, uh, the most amazing uh, gene sequencing uh, story. I already told you with, with Sanger we had the original gene sequencing technology, but this is a breakthrough uh, that came out of the chemistry department with professors Shankar Balasubramanian and David Klenerman, who revolutionized gene sequencing again. And it is, it is a remarkable story, uh, both in terms of the reduction of the cost, and I'll show you uh, um, a um, graph in a moment, but also the story uh, and a great financial success. We sold it for 640 million pre-revenue to Illumina, uh, Illumina now dominates the gene sequencing market with about a 90% marketing market share of all gene sequencing in the world. But arguably, we sold out a little bit too early because it's now worth 15 billion, uh, just the sequencing part of it. Uh, a sort of ameliorating circumstance of uh, this early sale, though, <laughs> is that the European headquarters of Illumina are in Cambridge and all the design and the further development of these uh, gene sequencing machines uh, is also still in Cambridge. But let me tell you the story of uh, John West. John West uh, used to be in charge of a billion dollar division of ABI, which at the time uh, was the dominant gene sequencing technology in the world. And we came to see him and they said, uh, John, we've got uh, bad news and we've got good news for you. The bad news is we've got this instrument uh, in Cambridge that is 100 times better than the one that you are selling. We're going to blow you out of the water. And the good news is that we want you to do it. <coughs> and he did. He is an MIT graduate. He came to Cambridge. He saw that we had a, a totally revolutionary way of sequencing by synthesis rather than the Sanger method. And uh, uh, the following thing happened. He, as the brash American, uh, appeared in Cambridge saying, guys, we're going to have a 1G machine in 12 months' time, 1G being a, a billion base pairs per experiment. And a number of the best people in Selexa left in disgust and said, this guy is a total idiot. There's no way we can have a working machine in 12 months' time. And both of them were right. Uh, he managed to sell a machine in 12 months' time, and it didn't work. Now. Uh, why, did, why would people buy a machine that didn't work? Well, John uh, knew his market very well, and he'd been selling these machines that didn't work for a long time. So he, he knew, uh, uh, why would they do this? Well, there was a very fierce competition between all the gene sequencing centers in the world to do more sequencing, especially human uh, sequencing. And he told them, look, our machine doesn't quite work yet, but if you pay the full price for this machine, I can only work, there were eight competitors there, I can only work with three of you, and if I, if I work with you, uh, in a year's time, we have this really working, and you'll have a machine that has a throughput that's 100 times the throughput of the machines that you have right now. And they all went for it, except for the Broad uh, Institute, and um, uh, they said, uh, look, uh, we uh, will buy 15 machines of you under one condition, that you don't tell anybody else that we're doing it. So 
uh, it was just a phenomenal success, completely revolutionized gene sequencing, and this is why. This is Moore's law here. As you know, it's a factor of two uh, every two years, and I've basically lived off Moore's law all my life. Uh, so I knew this very well. But this is when the Selexa machine started, and this is a log scale here. This is the most amazing reduction in cost, and it continued actually below $1,000 now. This is a factor of 10,000 in seven years. I have never come across a reduction in cost of anything important at quite such a spectacular scale, a factor of 10,000 in seven years. So we will soon, and this will continue. So we will soon be down at um, maybe a hundred dollars, a couple of hundred dollars, and then uh, you will do it for every baby that's being born for the same reason that you're blood typing babies at the moment. These are the geniuses behind it, uh, Shankar Palasupramanian on the left, uh, David uh, Klenerman, and John West, who is the genius CEO uh, who um, managed to bootstrap that company up uh, very elegantly. Uh, I want to finish off on uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, Alan Turing, I've already mentioned, also a member of my, my college at uh, King's College. And uh, uh, recently, you might have uh, seen the film The Imagination Game that uh, Redman got his uh, Oscar for. It's this wonderful story about Turing thinking about computability, writing you know, his very academic papers on it. But then in 1953, writing a paper uh, on the subject of compute, can computers think? And the way he answered this uh, was not yes or no, but devising the Turing test, saying, well, if a human can't tell whether behind the screen you have a computer or a human, then I will call this uh, an intelligent um, computer. Uh, on the top right here, you've got Steve Young, who is one of the foremost experts in voice recognition. If you ever turned on voice recognition in uh, a Microsoft environment, that's Entropic, which is a company that we sold to Microsoft uh, uh, quite a few years ago. And um, last year, uh, uh, we sold another spin out from Steve Lab. He's, the, he's uh, in, the, in the engineering lab in Cambridge. Uh, to Apple, which is doing the next generation Siri, because as you probably know, uh, we've just gone through this amazing transformation of a user interface in computing from keyboards to touch. Well, we're about to have a similar, maybe even more important user interface change from touch to voice. Because when voice works really well, you don't really need anything else. And especially with uh, the Internet of Things, uh, to have uh, an interface for each of the Internet of Things uh, really is uh, not sensible. You want to have a universal interface, and that's the voice interface. Voice recognition, because of uh, deep learning mainly in neural networks, is already better than humans. So it's actually not a voice recognition problem. It's a dialogue problem. So the problem really of having a good voice a user interface is what does the computer say back to you when it, when it is understood what you, what you say. And it's really that conversation that then will allow you to complete a task. So the criterion for a successful uh, a voice user interface has changed from the voice recognition rate that we were all after for a long time to task completion. Can you actually do what the user wants you to do? And I uh, mentioned um, uh, uh, Zubin Garamani because he's one of the rising stars uh, in artificial intelligence in this world. And uh, in my opinion, we'll see the next big step in AI is not these classification problems or regression problems that uh, uh, deep neural network serves so very well, but it's clever model building is, is actually coming up with an automated way of doing this. Uh, and another graduate uh, of uh, Queen's College, uh, actually Pamela's College, is um, um, uh, uh, this guy who runs uh, um, Google DeepMind. Uh, Google bought it for 500 million uh, last year. Um, Demis Hassab is, is his uh, name. And I think this month, uh, he will show the world a world Go champion. Uh, I don't know how many of you play Go, but uh, you know it's one of those um, things uh, that can waste a lot of time on, as I have done in, uh, uh, in my young days. It's a, 
board game that's uh, much harder than chess because there's so many more combinations. And the reason why it's so much harder to write a computer program for chess, uh, for Go, is that in chess uh, you can straightforwardly, well, you can assign a particular value to uh, a particular configuration of chess pieces on the board. This is very hard to do in, in a Go. And you really have to have the sort of right feeling for whether you know, a particular configuration is uh, advantageous to you or not. And deep learning and uh, deep neural networks really help with that. And Demis has already beaten the European, world champ the European champion in Go. And uh, he'll have one of the grandmasters from Japan coming over to London in uh, March um, to do that. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, this will work. So uh, finishing off on artificial intelligence, we have this uh, Turing test. Uh, we had uh, Entropic with the Microsoft voice recognized vocal IQ that we sold to Apple for the next generation Siri. And Garamani's uh, main project at the moment is called Automated uh, Statistician, which is an amazing program where you put in XY coordinates and the program will give you a 10-page report in English saying what uh, this uh, means. He's also just founded uh, a very high-profile startup called Geometric Intelligence with Gary Marcus, uh, uh, a, um, a New York uh, guy. So I'll finish here so we can have some tea. So I'll uh, uh, told you a bit about Cambridge University, uh, Silicon Fen, or Cambridge Phenomenon, as it's called, um, Sinclair, Acorn, ARM, and CSR in computing. <coughs> Um, Cambridge Antibody Technology, AppCam, and Selexa, which is now Illumina on the life science side, and AI, which right now I think is the biggest uh, game in town and the biggest thing humanity has ever done uh, with these new machine learning techniques. Uh, it's a very scary uh, time, but also a very exciting time, because in particular, this combination of life sciences with machine learning could solve the, the biggest problem that we have, which is phenotype from genotype. And machine learning is, in a way, the ideal uh, <clears throat> process of doing this. Thank you very much. So we'll take two questions now, and then we're going to move into T mode, where we'll shift most of the Q&A. So who wants to start? Richard. First of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was wonderful to see your appreciation of people over technology, which doesn't really exist here in Bell. We have, I have two questions, but don't count as one. Could you tell us about some failures where you thought they were extraordinarily promising, because we don't hear about why things failed? And secondly, <coughs> If the UK leaves uh, the EU, how will it affect all of you in your domain? Well, it's not quite a failure yet, but it, but it has been very, very hard going. Uh, it's a company called Plastic Logic, uh, where we invented a plastic transistor. Uh, and we've actually perfected it to work pretty well. It works as well as amorphous silicon now, with mobilities up to five. When we started, it had mobility of 10 to the minus two. Um, we poured, it's also one of the biggest investments that I have orchestrated over the years, about half a billion. Uh, so it does work now, so it might, it might still not be a, a, a great um, a disappointment. But uh, right now, uh, and it is a, a great technology for the Internet of Things in particular, but it's difficult to see that we're going to make uh, uh, money with this. So it's, it's been, uh, I, I started that in the year 2000. It's been 15 years in the making, and uh, you know we might get a few tens of millions back, but to see half a billion coming back is, is, is tough. So, however, uh, technology, um, from a technology point of view, it's been a success. And that's, I've done over 100 um, uh, investments in my life. And on the ICT side, as opposed to the life science side, out of the 100, I've only seen one single company where the technology didn't work. The technology often doesn't work quite as well as it should, or you know, especially not on time. But that it doesn't work at all, uh, I only have one example, which is Polite. 
uh, which is a company that uh, we were trying to use chalcogenides for a, a worm disk. And this physicist came in one day and proved to us on the blackboard that what we were trying to do couldn't be done. So he was very proud of his formula. On the other hand, he knew that after he was finished with his formula, we had to shut the company down, which we did. Richard, let's take your second question into the Tea with Herman session. Yes. Thank you for the fascinating and inspiring talk. So my first question is, how can we keep up on the frontiers of AI so that after you fly, fly back to England and next month and after, we want to know what are the most exciting developments in <coughs> AI? Is there some resource, some website, some newsletter that we can use to keep up? And then my second question is, some people say, you know, although there are abundant programmer jobs now, and you know, we're reaching a point where programmers will not only take away the jobs of lawyers and doctors, but pro programs will take away the jobs of programmers as programs, you know, write their own programs. Well, oh, absolutely. Uh, we will have super intelligences by about 2050 that uh, are smarter than us in everything that we do. <clears throat> is my opinion, and uh, I, I, this opinion seems to be shared by the machine learning community. The, uh, the first question was, where, where can you find out? Well, watch DeepMind, uh, I mean, uh, 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 Demis does publish, or also watch uh, Apple on the, dis on the um, uh, uh, discussion front, on the dialogue front, although Apple doesn't publish uh, so much, and watch uh, Zubin, Gagarmani in the engineering lab. He's got an AI lab. It's called the uh, Machine uh, Learning Group. Now, I'm concerned enough about the second issue that you raised, that I'm supporting the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, which uh, Lord Rees, uh, Martin Rees, who was head of the uh, Royal Society, uh, started in Cambridge. And we just managed to get um, 10 million from the Leverhulme uh, organization to study this in more detail, together with uh, Nick uh, Bostrom at Oxford. And it is not clear how this is going to pan out. I'm not, normally uh, when uh, there is a problem with um, machines taking over from people, you've got the problem of poverty, that these people then don't have enough to eat. Mm. I don't think that's going to be our problem, because I think the productivity increase will be such that you can easily pay for everybody to have a nice life. The, the problem is going to be, what do you do with the people that we've trained, like pathologists, for example, is a good example. We train these people up over a, a long period of time, become real experts. Uh, you know, these are highly qualified people. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, one of their main uh, areas of expertise, like uh, you know, recognizing cancer cells or something, uh, is taken over by my machines. So I think the answer to that, of course, is lifelong learning. I mean, they're smart people, so they've got to, to do something else and uh, uh, being, being more adaptable. But it's not clear how this is going to pan out, especially if it's going to happen very fast, as I expect this uh, to happen. Thank you.